And this year we have um, Dan Gavin, who's a professor in the ge um, geography department. He has been, um, as we were just discussing, in Oregon for about nine years, and he's been doing this work for um, about 20. And um, please join me in welcoming Dan. Thank you. Hey. Um, yeah, I'd like to present some work that uh, some of my students have been doing. Um, here, I'm a geography professor. I can see from my background, I um, out of college, I wanted to study forest ecology, but I wanted to have a longer term perspective on it because a lot of the you know trees reach great ages, and the ecological processes that are important for trees don't happen on like a human lifetime scale. They they add up over hundreds and thousands of years, and some of the things we see out on the land today are the results of not just the last few decades, but actually the last few thousands of years, and even longer if you take, ask different questions. So, um, so that's what got me into this line of work, and it was it became kind of addictive, and I, I really enjoyed um, kind of taking this historical ecology um, perspective on forests. Um, and I'll actually be also talking about salmon uh, in this in this project. I took kind of took an opportunity of of a, of a for doing a project. And Jen Kusler, my uh, master's student there, did a huge amount of work. And this work um, hasn't really seen that much uh, light of day. And I think we're, we're going to wrap it up this summer, even though most of the work has happened about three years ago. So let's jump into this. Um, OK, so we are um, somewhere around here. This is a new map of the Triangle Lake area made by a LIDAR, a laser, a plane-borne laser scanner of the landscape. And you can scan and it hits the ground and bounces back to the detector and um, you can remove the trees from the image and see what the bare ground looks like. And so you can see Lake Creek sinuously flowing around into Triangle Lake and then Triangle Lake heading down the falls to the lower Lake Creek um, here. And, um, and Little Lake and Triangle Lake. And the landslide which created this whole landscape um, was a huge slump off this, uh, off this slope and it kind of came out. Because you can see the old slopes have this highly dissected streams cut into the hillside kind of feature, but a landslide results in a very hummocky, irregular surface. So this massive landslide came out and it extended all the way out to here, like that. You can kind of see how it's just kind of stands out. And then there was another landslide that came off this slope and kind of is like this big uh, toe uh, sticking out into the lake there. Um, so, uh, so lots of work have been done at Little Lake and up here, and um, which I'll get to in a little bit later, um, uh, by my predecessor, Kathy Whitlock, in the uh, geography department. Um, and now we're continuing work here. And I have long, longer or near-term plans to really develop larger projects to get more information out of this area um, by getting more samples from here. Um, uh, so let me. Uh, so here is a bathymetric map of Triangle Lake. It goes down to 95 feet, really steep-sided. This is an old map. I'm currently trying to update it, um, and. Uh, and this, and the, but if you can imagine the, uh, what, what happened after that landslide, let me back up. Actually, I'm finding this. Um, what happened after that landslide was that it didn't just dam up the valley and create Triangle Lake, but the lake extended all the way up like a modern day reservoir would extend up into the hills. And it's taken thousands of years to fill up. And now Triangle Lake is like the, the last holdout of the of the former much larger lake. Um, <clears throat> so the sediments which have accumulated and which have filled up the Lake Creek Valley um, are kind of fill up, they fill up lakes as erosion from the hillsides to litter materials, um, plant growth, aquatic algae, algae growth within the lake grow and die and accumulate on the lake bottom and accumulate over time, and uh, so a whole mixture of kinds of materials accumulate in sediment and. You pour down through it, you go back in time. A small lake in the Cascade Mountains might have about one meter equivalent to a thousand years of time. Um, 
and um, but it's uh, fairly safe to get offended. Things like charcoal from fires, pollen from the plants, dust, all accumulate in the in the lake bottom and may get mixed around a lot, but in the right kind of sites, they don't get mixed around that much. And you can uh, core down through it and see something like this. So this is a two-inch diameter core. And the, in the kind of the rich history, which exists in the accumulated sediment, it's like, there's, there's got to be something to tell from this. <laughs> this, is a, um, this is a site uh, called Squaw Lakes in, uh, um, in the Applegate Valley by the uh, California border. And uh, this site had a really interesting history of, of um, erosion events, these crazy silts. Um, and then in between them is organic mud with uh, diatom, those white lines, blooms. Every summer, the lake produces a diatom bloom. It's a green algae. And it produces this, these little layers of diatoms in the sediment. So this particular site was a great site to study erosion through time. And we got a 2,000-year record of uh, like flooding events which produced erosion into the lake. And we could show that the erosion which occurred after uh, road building in the 1950s produced three meters of sediment in the lake, mm -hmm. while the rest of the last 2,000 years was seven meters of sediment. <laughs> and that <laughs> the um, erosion input from the after road construction and then the 1964 floods um, resulted in a, an event which would have been something that we would have expected only once in every 20,000 years um, based on the statistics you can generate from the longer term 2,000 year record. So you know we have like the 100 year flood event which we tried to plan around. This longer record kind of shows how that 100 year event changes over time. But also um, that an event that was generated in terms of erosion from poorly constructed roads um, from the 1950s resulted in an event which <coughs> is, is like um, 10, 100 times greater than, um, than what, uh, the natural variability of the past had. So this kind of uh, data are, are, um, are something we want to think about, and they provide um, raw, hard, raw numbers for that. So this is um, uh, Little Lake, just up off here. And this has been a, a much easier site to work at because Triangle Lake is so deep. It's difficult to get the sediment from the bottom. So what I want to show is just one of the things that you can get from these cores, pollen, which is dispersed from plants every, every spring, um, <coughs> is identifiable often to the genus level, but sometimes to the species level, sometimes only to the family level. But it is made out of incredibly resistant stuff, um, which doesn't decay um, as soon as oxygen levels drop in the sediment. So, in the bottoms of lakes, oxygen drops fairly uh, rapidly once a little organic matter decays. And then this stuff is preserved. And it can last for millions of years in rocks even. Um, so um, you can identify spruce and Douglas fir and um, uh, aster and willow and things like that from these, uh, um, from just light microscopy. You just take a teaspoon of sediment out of your core give it some acids and base, put it on a slide, and identify the pollen. And then you have a picture of what the vegetation looked like in the past. Um, so this is a 40,000 years out of Little Lake, uh, which is, I guess you should say right off, that this is an unusual kind of site. Um, in, across North America, there aren't many places like this uh, that, that go back so far in time as the Triangle Lake landslide area. Um, and this is a study by Rorona and Whitlock. It's been redone a few times, and we're even redoing it still a little bit now. Um, <clears throat> but you can see that there are some uh, huge changes through time. Like, look at red alder abundance. From 40,000 years ago on the left to present on the right, there are time periods when red alders aren't that common, and it's virtually absent. Then, in the last 14,000 years, red alder is very common. <laughs> okay. Any idea? Um, any idea why? Um, yes. <laughs> so we go through these periods uh, called um, ice age cycles, and Triangle Lake is great because it extends through the last ice age maximum. Twenty-one thousand years ago was a globally very cold time. Ice sheets were all over Canada. Uh, ice sheets extended into northern Washington, the Vashon, 
a uh, little went over Seattle to Olympia, Washington. The coast range was just not quite high enough to get glaciers, though. Um, but the glaciers are in the Cascades, and they came down to Mackenzie Ridge. There's a lot of ice around mm -hmm. and fairly cooler temperatures. So that's the time period called the glacial maximum, 25,000 to 14,000 years ago, which is this middle period when you have spruce pollen, and not that much western hemlock, not that much fir, and pines, which were present before. This brown is interesting. Before that, it was this uh, pine and fir, which is um, actually noble fir, not a tree we have in the coast range very much anymore, um, and uh, western hemlock. This pine was western white pine, um, also a tree we don't really have in the coast range anymore, um, but it was very abundant back then. And you go into the glacial ice age period, and it's spruce and fir. And Douglas fir, which was here, you know, our tree Douglas fir, wasn't here at all. Was Douglas fir was probably in California at this time. Um, and then Douglas fir comes back with a vengeance around 14,000 years ago. And it walks back. It walked, yes. Pine, pine cone by pine cone. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, Her well, the winds blow the seeds, but probably not very quickly because the major wind dir yeah. directions are not exactly south to north. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So in that bottom section, are you know, the pines the brown area or the dark gray area? Do well, so there's lots of different kinds of pines. And oh, okay, so they're all with different pine, With pollen, you can tell pines that have five needles as a, they're a separate group of pines, mm -hmm. and pines which have two and three needles are another group. So but they're all pines. With a pine with a pine pollen, they're all pinus, yeah. yeah. With pine pollen you can sometimes say for sure it's a five needle pine type of pollen. And here it would only be western white pine. And then I won't get into any details. Okay. But then it's there's okay. lodgepole okay. pine, which just generates tons of pollen. If you ever have a, if you have a shore pine on your mm -hmm. driveway you know that. So um, uh, lodgepole shore pine. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so then, um, then as you come into this period where after it warms up after the Ice Age uh, period, around 14,000 to 11,000 is the warm up period. And then that, you enter, um, after 11,000 period, you enter a time that's actually warmer than today. At least the summers were warmer than today. So if we're thinking about global warming into the future, you only have to look back about 10,000 years to a time when the Oregon Coast Range had hotter summers than they do at least, you know, in recent history, maybe not this. Maybe this summer is like, uh, <laughs> maybe like back then. Um, so, um, uh, so we have a lot of Douglas fir, a lot of forest fire, and, um, and then around 6,000 years ago is when we see old growth forests, um, kind of really uh, starting to be common. So the core, which we recently got near. Trying uh, near Little Lake is great because it has a, a 60 meters deep, with a, obtained by a drill rig, and we could wash a lot of the sediments and find needles, rather than relying on pollen, which can't give you the species all the time. And the big unknown about the last ice age was all that spruce pollen. Like we don't have any spruce in the coast range today, right? Yeah. Oh, except the Sitka spruce along the, along right. the. Um, Along the coast, there's actually a cypress tree which comes all the way over here. Not very, not very much of it. Um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, but the other spruce is Engelman spruce, and the uh, and the, the um, it was very unclear, really different ecological interpretation of the past. If it was Sitka spruce or Engelman spruce, which is the Cascade subalpine species. So we identify things, and we also identify fur. This is a subalpine fir needle that's around 23,000 years old. And it's, um, it's a, you know, subalpine fir is a cascade high elevation species. But then I was interesting to find all these Sitka spruce needles. So this is a Sitka spruce needle from the same sample, um, a this sharp tip point flat spruce needle. And um, <clears throat> so that means that we had kind of this coastal rainforest, like cool, wet climate, which is what Sitka spruce likes. But we also had subalpine fir, which is what the High Cascades like, uh, have subalpine fir. So, but back then they were existing together. So how could that be? 
is a, is a mystery which we call a non, we think that is a non-analog, but you actually only have to go up to southeast Alaska to find a kind of situation where you have Sitka spruce trees and subalpine fir trees not that far apart from each other. So this is near um, um, the fjords, Fjordlands National Park, um, kind of near Ketchikan, and it's, uh, it's this cool maritime forest. Uh, snow comes down to sea level, but it's not extremely deep snow. Um, in the high mountains, there are glaciers which can extend to fairly low elevations, um, but not all the way to sea level around Ketchikan. So, um, so that could very well be the kind of the kind of situation we had here back 20,000 years ago in the coast range. Um, just kind of go up the coast to, to there. Um, the kind of insights we get from identifying, making discoveries of the species from these cores. Um, in the early Holocene, um, this is a, a, lot of, a, bunch, a lot of evidence from the region which shows that oak woodlands were a lot more abundant than they used to be um, in the Willamette Valley. Uh, a lot of oak pollen, a lot of fire on the hill slopes, probably trees didn't reach very great ages, and, um, and you had um, oak, oak woodlands, grasslands being uh, much more extensive. Then going to about 6,000 years ago, then things get wetter. Um, the climate. So that's a kind of a background of what I do with the pollen and paleo ecology. But I thought with the Watershed Council uh, visit here, I'd talk about salmon um, because I had one project that, um, that, that addressed this. And, um, and, and sediments, which accumulate so many different things, um, could potentially give us a history of the salmon populations which run through them. So I'm not a fish biologist at all. This isn't, uh, I rely on a lot of input from others to do this work, but I have the tools to do a project like this, but then I have to collaborate with others. So I kind of value input from fish biologists and, they, and lots of people on these kinds of studies. Um, but we know there is a climate salmon link, right? We know warm stream temperatures are harmful for salmon, headline yesterday um, in the Albany uh, Tribune. Uh, and we know that um, you know, stream flow is also important for salmon. And we know that these things have changed over thousands of years. So it's reasonable to ask how much have the salmon populations changed over thousands of years, too, in response to those climate changes. So um, one way to do it is to look at the effect of nutrients which salmon bring to the riparian ecosystems, the marine-derived nutrients. Um, the uh, salmon, like coho, will often die, not in the channel, but at the foot of trees. Um, and their nutrients get sucked up by the trees. Um, and we, a popular research t uh, area is how much riparian uh, ecosystems are dependent on the nutrient subsidies, which salmon have gained at the ocean and then deposited um, um, in the riparian zones. So this is a study I like to highlight from someone I know, uh, Deanne Drake uh, and her advisor, Bob Nyman, which um, she cored trees and measured tree rings of trees that were growing right on the riparian strip on the Umpqua River. And she measured the tree growth by you know, measuring tree ring width. And she did this in two places at each site. At one site, there was a salmon run accessible to the ocean. And she got a history of, the, of those trees growth over time. And then she went to a site just above a barrier at, on the Umpqua, I think it was the, Win I don't know if it was the Winchester Dam, it was another dam maybe, where, um, <clears throat> where she measured um, trees that were not along the riparian strip, but were not accessible to salmon. And then you'd look at the difference in the growth between the trees for each year, and that difference in growth could be the effect of the nutrients, you know, give a tree more nitrogen, it's going to grow faster. So, uh, or all the other nutrients too. So this is what they found, that uh, the tree, the difference in the tree growth between trees that were getting salmon and trees which weren't getting salmon had a positive relationship with the escapement, which is the number of fish which escaped everything else and were able to get up the river. So, um, uh, so when you had uh, years with 10,000 
the statement you had a lot faster tree growth in the years when you only had 2,000 uh, fish uh, up that stream. So, um, so it's, it's, it's a promising result. And you can look at the history through time then. So here's a history of that tree growth reconstructed salmon run through time. <laughs> um, from a, and, then, and it matches to so the black line from 19, 1750 to 2000. The black line is that tree growth record. When the line is high, it's more salmon. When the line is low, there's less salmon, is the interpretation. Um, or possibly lamprey, too, because lamprey is also a running species at this site. Um, and then, uh, um, and then the, the open, the, the other line here with the circles is the observations of the fish run. So it um, you know, matches the observations for the last 50 years. So then maybe this is reality going back in time on um, what the variation in fish runs have been. So you can see when Manchester Dam was reconstructed, it kind of it, it stopped this long, like 20 years, appears to be a cycle of 20 to 30 years of high fish, low fish. And there might be a climate cycle that's related to this fish abundance. So with the dam construction, the peaks don't get as high, and the periodicity changes. But then, I, I don't know the history of this site too well, but I think um, with um, fish ladders at the dam and more, um, uh, more enhancements, the, um, the, the population runs are, are, are getting a little bit higher, but then they've declined um, in recent years. So again, this is a study a few years old, of course. Um, so another way uh, to do it is to, um, so, so to get even a longer term perspective is to go to the segments. And I, I know I probably need to speed up a bit here to get to this photo, but there's not too much left. You have more, a little bit more than 10 minutes. Oh, I do? Okay. 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 As long as, if anyone needs to leave. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, and do I, and please interrupt me. I'm kind of maybe talking fast or I don't know. Um, I yeah. Just, I just had one thought. Uh, with the sound of nutrients, yes. would you say it was a softer wood or a harder wood that was forming? Ah. Because the rapid growth would indicate a softer wood. Yes. That often happens when you say supply nutrients mm -hmm. on, on trees. The wood is, um, it's, yeah, right. right. Mm -hmm. it, um, it still has the same amount of sunlight to grow. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it has it spreads more carbon over less area, or yeah, the wood's softer. Like you, um, you really see it with biosolids are sprayed on forests, uh, mm -hmm. which happens in some watersheds where the cities. Yeah, right here. Oh, with biosolid applications. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, the rings are huge, and the wood is probably you can poke your finger in it or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, but that is something that could be measured. Mm -hmm. um, you can use x-rays and measure the density of the wood. So, yeah. um, so uh, the nitrogen cycle is super complex cycle of nutrients that cycle between organic forms when the nitrogen is connected to carbon and is in plants or animals, and then it gets released and, and goes into uh, ammonia and nitrates and nitrates, which, have, which aren't connected to carbon anymore, but then they can get uptaked back up into plants and used again. Um, and so there's the cycling. The ultimate source for all of this is the atmosphere, which is a wash in nitrogen. 80% of our air is nitrogen gas, but it's not available to the plants. It needs to be um, fixed, taken by little bacteria, which are associated with red alder. Uh, red alder has um, a lot of this bacteria, and alder puts a lot of nitrogen into the soil. The Coast Ranch has a lot of soil nitrogen because of the amount of red alder, which at least historically has been in the Coast Range forests. So, um, so that's create, made the coast range extremely productive um, in addition to its climate for our tree growth. Um, so this nitrogen um, is, is increased by fixation cycles and then some is lost um, by this, uh, in, especially in low oxygen environments by other bacteria which change the nitrates back into nitrogen gas. Okay, so that's just a little, a, a little background on the nitrogen cycle. 
Now, the interesting thing is that there's two kinds of nitrogen. <laughs> nitrogen is an element, it's an atom with seven protons, um, and usually seven neutrons, which gives, the, gives it a weight of 14 um, atomic units, um, which is this, shown by this diagram. So the, the blues are neutrons and the reds are protons, and they've got electrons orbiting them. But there's something called a stable isotope, which is a different version of nitrogen. Nitrogen is defined by the seven protons, but you can stick on another neutron, and it's now a little bit heavier. It's now it's 15 atomic mass units, and, um, but it, it, chemically it reacts the same way as the other nitrogens. The only difference is, is that it's um, a little heavier, which makes it uh, a little more sluggish in how it uh, moves through the environment. Okay. Uh, so you can measure this stuff uh, with a tool called a mass spectrometer, and it's not only like $20 or $15 a measurement. Um, and you can, um, so you can measure the ratio between these two, and it's a really useful tracer about what's going on in the environment. Um, we express the, since I'm going to be showing you some numbers, we express the numbers as this, this, uh, this kind of symbol, delta 15n, and then the air, uh, we express it relative to air, so air has a value of zero, so if you have a number greater than zero, it's got more nitrogen 15 than what you have in the air. Metabolic processes, it's the lighter nitrogen which gets removed from the P, um, and it's the heavier nitrogen which gets stuck up in the meat and the muscle, and then when something eats something else, the concentration of nitrogen continues to, um, of nitrogen 15 continues to increase. So a big old, a big fish, which is eating little fish, which is eating smaller fish, which is eating plankton, ends up having a lot of nitrogen 15 in it. Um, so uh, uh, all that nitrogen 14 has been essentially peed out. Um, so essentially it's a, for the predator, it's like the nitrogen 15 of the prey plus three. Um, three units every, every time it goes up. So um, nitrogen 15 is, is then can be measured in every part of the soil or the plants and the sediments and in the animals. It can just be measured anywhere. There's organic stuff. So, um, uh, so um, let's not look at this too much, but, uh, <laughs> but you can see that when you've got plants as the source of the nitrogen, like the plants, the bacteria fixing nitrogen out of the air, all the values are going to be around 0 to 1 to 2 because it's just, um, there's no differentiation in nitrogen 15 as it's taken out of the air into the plant, into the bacteria to be fixed, into ammonia, and then it is, um, it's all fairly low values. In contrast, salmon, or the animals which are eating high on the food chain, have very high um, N15 values. So uh, coho salmon has a 15N value of 13.5. A, a nitrogen 15 value of 13.5. So if a lot of the nitrogen in the ecosystem is derived from salmon, it's going to have a lot more of this nitrogen 15 in it compared to the other nitrogen which comes from fixation from red alder uh, roots. So, um, so this uh, method was really promising a study in science when this guy Bruce Finney did a study of lake sediments and showed that this lake in south central Alaska had a, a nitrogen 15 through time, this is 300 years, which matched the actual catch record history, and it showed that, it, uh, um, that this is a, a tool which can be used to reconstruct past salmon. Unfortunately, since then, many other studies have claimed that it doesn't work because there's a lot of other things which affect this, affect this, iso this ratio, this number. Nevertheless, not having done this before, I wanted to do it. So I went to Wohink Lake because I thought that was a good site. Wohink Lake is here. It's got a very small watershed. It flows into Silkus Lake, which then flows to the ocean. Um, and Wohink Lake is deep, fairly big, in a small watershed. The average raindrop, which falls onto the Wohink Lake watershed, takes a year to get to the ocean, which is a really long time for the coast range because the lake is so deep, um, it's so big, and the watershed is so small, like 30% of the watershed is the lake area itself. 
So it's uh, a good place for nitrogen to accumulate and sit there and not get washed out into the ocean. So if there is coho going into Wohig Lake, and there are coho going into Wohig Lake, not a lot today, but there are some, then, um, then they, are, um, they are going to be putting, adding their nitrogen um, into that lake system. So we core the lake, um, with this system where you push a tube into the mud and get a meter at a time. And it was challenging because it was, I think, 22 meters of water, like 67 feet or something like that, <coughs> of, uh, of water to uh, have to push down and haul out. It's very um, labor intensive. And then we also core Triangle Lake as a control because Triangle Lake doesn't have salmon, not before the fish ladder. Uh, so, um, if we could do it like that tree ring study, where we compared um, uh, trees with salmon and without salmon, we're comparing a lake with salmon and a lake without salmon. So, um, so we get radiocarbon dates, and we can find out the age through radiocarbon dating. And we got about 7,000 years out of Wohink Lake and about 6,000 years out of Triangle Lake um, before ran out of steam at Triangle Lake because we couldn't get 40,000 years out of the middle of Triangle Lake because it's so deep. It was so much effort to, it's just, you're just using your back muscles <laughs> to get this stuff up. So we got eight meters out and then we just had to stop. Um, <laughs> or I'd lose all my gear at the bottom of the lake or something. Um, so, um, so this is the result. So this is the nitrogen 15 over time. And Wohink Lake starts really high at 7,000 years ago, at values of 6 to 7. And it drops down, and it goes back up, and then it kind of goes this slow decline. And then there's some missing data, and it's not entirely my fault. But then at the top, it shoots back up again, okay, in the last historic period. Um, Triangle Lake is lower values, the values are around 1.5 to 2.5, and, and there's not much change through time. So these are the numbers that you'd expect if all the nitrogen was just coming from alder roots in the ecosystem. And to get numbers up around four, values of four, you, you have to invoke uh, marine nutrients, salmon. There's no way to get the ecosystem to produce numbers that high. So that, that was like, yes, there's this long history of, of salmon um, in Wolving Lake, and there's a trend. Um, there's some kind of historical decline over thousands of years, and then this puzzling increase over the last historic period, which is not what we would expect to see, right, with fishing and everything. So, um, uh, so um, how big is that little last bite? Is that yeah? That's since the fish years? ladder was built. That's no, all, all the fish moved. <laughs> yeah, no, it's actually so it it dates to around the last 50 years. And it dates to when development happens around the lake. And what we're, what we're not seeing is septic systems, exactly. We're not seeing fish. We're seeing, or, or the lack of septic systems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you got organic matter, you know, lots of human sources of organic matter in the lake. <laughs> What's that? People eat higher on the Yes. Also. Yes. Our, our, Waste has a high nitrogen 15 value. You can see where Triangle Lake jumped up in the last 50 years, too. Yes, there is a little thing here. Now, perhaps that is also like human uh, septics around Triangle Lake, or it's, um, or it's the fish ladder. I, I don't know if you could um, say that. Uh, more, more the people. people. Yeah. In terms of like biomass, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, so this long-term decline can be somewhat explained climate cl with our understanding of climate change through this period. There is this coastal upwelling which provides nutrients along the coast, which provides all the nutrients for the food chain to grow our fish in the ocean. And there is this long-term um, long-term decline in the strength of that upwelling over, over the last 7,000 years, which has been observed in, um, which has been observed in, in oak cores taken in the ocean that, that study the upwelling process in the ocean. 
Um, and the ocean surface temperatures have also been increasing as the upwelling decreases, the ocean surface temperatures are increasing. So that kind of correlates with this decline. Then there's this craziness at the beginning of the record. Um, and this can be explained mostly by um, the fact that Wink Lake used to be an estuary. Uh, before the sand dunes were there, which dammed it up, it was connected to the ocean and it was a saltwater estuary. The bottom of Wink Lake today is well below sea level. When we lowered all that coring gear down, we went 10 meters below sea level to get the sediments out. It's called an over-deepened lake. Okay. So it used to be scoured out by the ocean and the bottom of the core is full of clamshells that are ocean marine estuary. We had about three meters of clamshells in the core. Um, I don't know if I have a picture of that somewhere. Um, so that's actually what I was just explaining. Anyway, um, and then, and then the sand dune, there's a lot, a good record that the coastal dunes got put in place around 7,000 years ago as sea level was coming up after the ice age. And then, um, and then it looked like there was a period when the, when the dam, you when know, the sand dune dam broke through and it became uh, fresh water. No, no, sorry, the dam got, got placed as fresh water, then it broke through and became an estuary again. And then the dune came back and finally dammed off the lakes, which is the source of all our coastal lakes, or the sand dunes, which blew in and dammed up the valleys. So, so what do you think that spike in the final lake is around 2.5? Oh, this one? Yeah. Or uh, in Triangle Lake. Oh, this big one, yeah. In fact, the regional one. I can't. Not my head. Yeah, there is something. It's real. Um, is that there, drop? On the end, when they made people get port bodies, I mean, <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. Huh, that's yeah, right. Isn't if that there that was originally true? poor septic in the valley, or, and then, I mean, that's all those little things right around. I mean, they're really yeah. narrow lots. Oh, it's always trailers. Yeah, <laughs> they they had probably just put it in the lake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. How long ago do you figure the landslide was that created Triangle Lake and the bigger lake? Yeah, so the original studies put it around 42,000 years, but our, our best core now, which really went all the way down to the soil, which was in the bottom of the valley before the landslide happened, we actually found the soil and the, tr and the logs which were on the, the soil right. surface, which then got flooded. Um, that dated to, well, it's radiocarbon dating is what we use, mm -hmm. and that maxes out, it's, it loses its power around 45 to 50,000 years ago. And the date that we got was significantly lower than the maximum possible age, but it's really difficult to date accurately there. So it's more than 42,000 years, but probably around 50,000 is our guess right now. Could you see any evidence of earthquakes in Sonoma and on the lake? Uh, tsunamis, yes. In Wohink Lake, some of these, um, some of these uh, events are related to tsunamis, which have been studied in other lakes in the south. Um, the time to right at the same time that tsunami deposits are known somewhere else. Yeah. How yeah. Um, well, Wilmington Lake's not a good lake to study the frequency, but the other site showed called Bradley Lake um, about 500 year intervals. Uh, I want to ask you back about trees. Yeah. <clears throat> in your first set of slides, sure. my favorite tree is the cedar. And you yeah. showed that thing in there during the Ice Age, it looked like, but not before. And I was wondering about that. Oh, the pollen studies. Yes. It was the top part was a cedar, I think. Yeah. Um, so right in there, there's a little bit of green right in that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's there. some there. There's a little bit there. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Um, it really doesn't pick up until the old growth forest phase around 6,000 years ago. It doesn't say what kind of cedar either. Maybe. It does. It, it's, it's actually family level Cupressaceae, which is a lot of stuff. But um, So this could be um, Alaska yellow cedar. Um, I don't have a needle to prove that, unfortunately. What is slide on? That is, oh, look at that. Yeah, it's not much of it. That is Ulmus incana or um, Ulmus incensis. They kind of change the names around. 
on the Sin on the Sinuata. Um, it's a it's a um, all there was frozen avalanche tracks in the Cascades. Mm -hmm. It's a natural picture too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, we, yeah, I, I, yeah. 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 <laughs> if there's any last point you want to make, I'd make it, and uh, we should probably well, wrap up. No. I, I, uh, I, I've been making some cool maps of the Lake Creek Valley, including uh, about right here. Wait. <laughs> that's a nice piece of art. Uh, um, you can imagine the slopes around here if they just continued back down to the valley that used to be here. In, in, a, in computer software, I've been removing the sediment and trying to reconstruct what the valley looked like before um, we had the Lake Creek uh, Valley bottom. And um, so this would be today's lake, and then in the past, it, it doesn't really show it that well. But um, <laughs> there's a, a cubic kilometer of mud in the valley <laughs> to make it <laughs> the way it is today. <laughs> And a lot, of, a lot of that came from uh, Prairie Mountain, maybe. Yeah, that's the one in the north. Yeah. Yeah. Washington. Could you see the erosion that spread out more since they've been clear cutting? Uh, you know, I thought I would see that in Triangle Lake record, but it's not obvious. It's not. There's a lot of distance between the clear cuts and the middle of the lake. So maybe if I cored right near the creek entrance, then maybe I would see that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. I agree. Very interesting. Absolutely fascinating. We could have you do maybe three different presentations. Yeah. <laughs> Keep me for a couple months. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Thanks. And hopefully you'll be around for a couple minutes. Sure. Yeah. Great. So people can get any uninsured questions answered. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. We had really good presentations.